what we want to do in this lecture is expand on the last lecture and ultimately explain how alpha motor neurons, which store in the spinal cord, right? That's where their cell bodies and dendrites are and travel through nerves out to skeletal muscle fibers within particular muscles, how these alpha motor neurons through this organization attaching the skeletal muscle fibers allows these skeletal muscle fibers to contract. And in order to do that, we're going to use the same example that we did in the last lecture about the biceps muscle. So to specifically discuss how alpha motor neurons get muscle fibers within the biceps muscle to contract, um, the first thing that has to happen is there needs to, there needs to be some conscious thought about contracting ultimately the biceps muscle. Okay. In the last lecture, I gave an example uh, where you want to lift up a glass of water to bring it to your mouth to take a drink. Okay. In order to do this, the first thing that has to happen is you need to have a conscious thought um, about performing this, right? You need to have a conscious thought about contracting your biceps muscle to produce elbow flexion and lift the glass towards your face to take a drink. And I think that's relatively easy to conceive. So that's the first thing that's going to happen. And when that happens, what's going to occur is neurons within the primary motor cortex, right? This region of the cerebral cortex right in front of the central sulcus, right? This gray matter, neurons up in this region are going to start generating action potentials. And more specifically, the portion, neurons within the portion of the primary motor cortex that control, you know, kind of the upper extremities, the, the biceps muscles, those are going to be the neurons that start generating action potentials. Uh, it, you know, it's kind of in this region of the primary motor cortex, not the, um, you know, perfectly medial region, not the lateral region. It's kind of in between the two, okay? So you have a conscious thought that you want to contract your biceps muscle to produce elbow flexion to lift this glass towards your face to take a drink. And now through that consciousness, right, the firing of other neurons, ultimately these primary motor cortex neurons um, will be activated. These primary motor cortex neurons will start generating action potentials. And, you know, you want to think, well, where do their axons go? Well, their axons travel through the core of the cerebrum, as we discussed in so much detail in the last lecture. And then their axons travel into the brainstem and down the spinal cord. And they don't travel very far down the spinal cord. Um, their axons ultimately terminate in the cervical regions of the spinal cord. And why is that? The reason for that is because we know that the alpha motor neurons that travel out also called somatic motor neurons, right? The alpha motor neurons are somatic motor neurons that travel out to the biceps muscle fibers. We know that their cell bodies and dendrites are located in the cervical region of the spinal cord, right? And the alpha motor neurons that, that activate the, the biceps muscle fibers, right? Their cell bodies and dendrites are located in the cervical region of the spinal cord. And we know that their axons travel through a couple different cervical nerves that ultimately merge together and form the musculocutaneous nerve or better said branch and form the musculocutaneous nerve. So their axons then travel through the musculocutaneous nerve where then finally they approach and synapse with the biceps muscle fibers. So the point is, if you want these neurons up in the primary motor cortex, to ultimately activate and cause biceps muscle fibers to contract, what these primary motor cortex neurons need to do is they need to pass action potentials to or activate the alpha motor neurons that travel out through the cervical nerves to the biceps muscle, the biceps muscle fibers. And we know 
that these alpha motor neurons that travel out to the biceps muscle fibers through these cervical nerves, um, we know that their cell bodies and dendrites are found in the cervical region of the spinal cord. So thus, the primary motor cortex neurons, if they're going to synapse with and activate these alpha motor neurons that travel out to the biceps muscle, then the primary motor cortex neurons only need to travel into and terminate in the cervical region of the spinal cord. Now, sometimes that's a completely different story, right? If there are alpha motor neurons located in the lower regions of the spinal cord that travel out through, let's say, you know, lumbar nerves to the gastroc muscle or something, then primary motor cortex neurons um, that, let's say, control the activation of the gastroc muscle by activating alpha motor neurons that go out to the gastroc muscle, right? These primary motor cortex neurons are going to travel way farther down the spinal cord. So the length that a primary motor cortex neuron travels down the spinal cord all depends upon uh, the, the muscle that it causes to contract. And ultimately, where the, that muscle's alpha motor neurons are located. Are they located in the lumbar region of the spinal cord? Are they located in the cervical region of the spinal cord? Um, that's what's going to determine how far these primary motor cortex neurons travel down the spinal cord. I know we discussed this to some degree in the last lecture already, but I, 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 from my experience, there's just um, there's too many people that are troubled by this anatomical organization of the primary motor cortex neurons and the alpha motor neurons and how this pathway ultimately results in the contraction of muscle. And I don't think it hurts to make sure that this pathway hopefully makes sense to you because, I mean, it's fundamental, uh, foundational, whatever you want to call it, to your, to ultimately the comprehension of all of this. So let's pretend that these are some of the primary motor cortex neurons that activate the alpha motor neurons that, that travel out to the biceps muscle fibers. Okay, You have a conscious thought about wanting to contract uh, your biceps muscle. So these primary motor cortex neurons start generating action potentials. And these primary motor cortex neurons pass action potentials to the alpha motor neurons in the cervical region of the spinal cord that travel out to the biceps muscle fibers. How do they do that? Well, we know that primary motor cortex neurons release the neurotransmitter, the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. So the primary motor cortex neurons release the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate, which binds to ligand gated channels on the dendrites of these alpha motor neurons that are about to travel out, that, that do travel out to the biceps muscle fibers. And that ultimately opens up these ligand data channels um, on the dendrites of these alpha motor neurons. And those are really sodium channels. So glutamate allows sodium into these alpha motor neurons um, by opening up these ligand data channels. Sodium rushes in, heads towards the hillock region, gets the hillock region to threshold, and now the alpha motor neuron generates an action potential. Okay. So now the alpha motor neuron generates this action potential. Where does this axon go? Well, in this example, the axon travels through a cervical nerve out to the biceps muscle, where it synapses with a particular number of muscle fibers within the biceps muscle. For the moment, we don't care exactly how many muscle fibers the alpha motor neuron synapses with in the biceps muscle. We only want to focus on one, okay? So this is one location where the alpha motor neuron synapses with one muscle fiber within the biceps muscle. That's it, that's all we're looking at. I acknowledge, and this is gonna become important later on, that the alpha motor neuron actually synapses with many muscle fibers within the biceps muscle, not just one, uh, but we have to take this one step at a time. So we have to ultimately look at how the alpha motor neuron 
uh, allows for one muscle fiber within the biceps muscle to contract. To make sense of this, we have to go back to some basic anatomy of the skeletal muscle fiber. Okay, every skeletal muscle fiber has a plasma membrane. Okay. The plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber is oftentimes called its sarcolemma. Um, you'll see that written in the literature a lot. Okay. It means the same thing as plasma membrane. Now, the really interesting thing about skeletal muscle fibers is the plasma membrane actually extends into the skeletal muscle fiber, right, right here. If you can actually take a look and you can see it like right there, the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber actually what's called invaginates into the skeletal muscle fiber and the plasma membrane actually runs down the uh, myofibrils. Specifically, it runs down pretty close to where uh, all the different Z discs within the myofibrils are located. The Z discs of the sarcomeres, of course. Okay, so knowing that part of the anatomy that the you know the the that the plasma membrane runs down the you know the myofibrils where the Z discs are located of the sarcomeres, that's not the most important thing in the world. the The most important thing in the world for this conversation, though, is to realize that the plasma membrane does in fact extend into the skeletal muscle fibers. And the place where the plasma membrane does this is called the T-tubule. Okay, what I'm highlighting in, in, in red here, these are the T-tubules. The T-tubules, again, are just an extension of the plasma membrane. And what lies on the left and right side of the T-tubules, what looks like that webbing, uh, in blue, we'll circle it, how about in green? Okay. That, that blue webbing that lies next to the T-tubule on the left and right side, that's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's actually a specialized type of smooth endoplasmic reticulum inside of the skeletal muscle fibers. And what you find in there, stored in there, is calcium. There is a ton of calcium that is stored inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, this webbing-like structure that sits on the left and right side of the T-tubule. Here's the T-tubule being depicted again, okay? So here's the plasma membrane, right? And an extension of the plasma membrane, let's do it in red, is the T-tubule. Look at, the T-tubule is an extension of the plasma membrane and it extends into the muscle fiber itself. And you see that there's many, many T-tubules. Ultimately, there's going to be hundreds and thousands of them. And they run down, the, specifically, we think, close to the z disc of the sarcomeres uh, within these myofibrils. And this is an image from your text showing the T-tubule and the fact that the sarcoplasmic reticulum, that webbing structure, lies on the left and right side of the T-tubule. And within the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, is where we find lots of calcium stored. Okay. So now let's go back to that conversation about the alpha motor neurons axon terminals meeting this skeletal muscle fiber, synapsing with it. What we need to really focus in on is where the axon terminal button, one of many, right? But where one axon terminal button of an alpha motor neuron meets the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber. Okay. Another word for this is right where the alpha motor neuron synapses with the skeletal muscle fiber. Where the alpha motor neuron synapses with the skeletal muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction. Can you see this? It's where the axon terminal button of an alpha motor neuron meets the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber. The name should make perfect sense. Neuromuscular junction, right? Where a neuron meets a muscle fiber, right? Where the two synapse with each other the neuromuscular junction. Whenever the word neuromuscular junction or, or phrase is thrown out there, um, what's being discussed, of course, is where the alpha motor neuron, 
meets the skeletal muscle fiber. And that happens at the level of the axon terminal button of the alpha motor neuron and the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber. That's where the two of them synapse. That's where the two of them meet. So that's what we need to focus in on. And we need to see what happens at the neuromuscular junction. This is how your textbook uh, shows the neuromuscular junction. Okay? But I'm going to draw you a picture of it because I think that there is a, a, a lot more to be said about the neuromuscular junction than, than what this image can provide you. So here we go. This is the axon terminal button of the alpha motor neuron. Okay, what's inside of it? Of course, just like every neuron inside of the um, axon terminal button are vesicles filled with a chemical messenger. In this case, it's going to be a neurotransmitter. Right? We'll talk about why that's the case in just a second. Um, and here we need to draw the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber. So here's the neuromuscular junction, right? Where the neuron, the alpha motor neuron, meets the skeletal muscle fiber, specifically where the axon terminal button of the alpha motor neuron meets the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber, right? That's the synapse. That's the uh, neuromuscular junction. So what's happening right now? The alpha motor neuron has generated an action potential, right? Uh, how? Because the primary motor cortex neuron, right, passed an action potential to the alpha motor neuron that started in the spinal cord, right? The primary motor cortex neuron released glutamate onto it, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, and that allowed the alpha motor neuron to actually generate an action potential. So the action potential is traveling down this alpha motor neuron. And what exists down its axon and thus axon terminals, voltage-gated sodium channels. So as the action potential is traveling down the alpha motor neuron's axon, right, there's a wave of positivity, sodium ions uh, being pulled into the subsequently negative region of the alpha motor neuron, its axon. Uh, it makes that region more positive. Now voltage-gated sodium channels are opening in the axon terminal of the alpha motor neuron that allows sodium to shoot in, drive this region up to positive 30. And now this wave of positivity, these sodium ions get pulled from the axon terminal into the button where it's still negative. And what does that do? It opens up voltage gated calcium channels in the um, axon terminal button of the alpha motor neuron. That allows calcium to shoot in and this is ultimately going to cause exocytosis of neurotransmitters. So this process by which ultimately chemical messengers are released through exocytosis is the same in every single neuron, right? The action potential heads into the axon terminal button for the purpose of opening up voltage-gated calcium channels so that calcium can rush in and cause ultimately exocytosis of the chemical messenger. In this case, the chemical messenger is always going to be acetylcholine, ACH. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter of all alpha motor neurons, right? Somatic motor neurons, the neurons that travel out to your skeletal muscle fibers. Every single one of them releases acetylcholine from its axon terminal buttons. We know this with 100% confidence. So when an alpha motor neuron generates an action potential, what's going to happen due to that action potential is the alpha motor neuron is going to release acetylcholine from its axon terminal buttons. And where is that acetylcholine going to go? Through exocytosis, it's going to be released into the synaptic cleft, right? But the synaptic cleft this time exists between a neuron and a skeletal muscle fiber. Right? It's still a synaptic cleft because it's a synapse between two cells, right? A neuron, and, and now instead of another neuron, uh, a skeletal muscle fiber. This is still a synapse. A synapse is just where um, a neuron meets another cell. And this is still a neurotransmitter because 
ultimately, a neurotransmitter, by definition, if you remember the definition of a, of a neurotransmitter, it's a chemical messenger released by a neuron that travels a very short distance and binds to another cell. And that's exactly what we're going to see happen here. So alpha motor neurons release, ultimately, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine onto skeletal muscle fibers. So now you think to yourself, what must the skeletal muscle fiber have? The skeletal muscle fiber must have ligand-gated channels on its plasma membrane that bind acetylcholine. And that's absolutely true. In this class, we don't differentiate really much with the names of different ligand-gated channels, but the ligand-gated channel that exists on skeletal muscle fibers that binds acetylcholine is actually called a nicotinic cholinergic receptor. Cholinergic receptor just means it binds acetylcholine. And since it was discovered using the drug nicotine, um, that's where its name came from. We discovered these receptors, these acetylcholine receptors, using nicotine. So it was named nicotinic cholinergic receptor. That's the type of acetylcholine receptor that skeletal muscle fibers have located on their plasma membranes. Generically, it would just be called a ligand-gated channel that is specific to acetylcholine, right? Ligand-gated because a ligand binds to it and opens it. And in, the, in this case, the ligand is acetylcholine that was released by the alpha motor neuron. So now the question turns into, what does acetylcholine binding to these ligand gated channels on skeletal muscle fibers called nicotinic cholinergic receptors do? So to explain this, we need to redraw the picture first of all. Here is the alpha motor neuron, alpha motor neuron, right? There's its axon terminal, axon terminal buttons. Inside of the axon terminal buttons, we find vesicles filled with the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. Here is the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber. and located on the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber underneath the axon terminal button of the alpha motor neuron we find ligand gated channels that bind acetylcholine okay. so the question is what does the neurotransmitter acetylcholine right, ach what does the neurotransmitter acetylcholine that is released from the axon terminal buttons of these alpha motor neurons do when it binds to these ligand gated channels on the plasma membranes of skeletal muscle fibers? And to understand that, you have to realize that skeletal muscle fibers have resting membrane potentials. Most of the cells in your body actually have resting membrane potentials. Some of them, it serves a much greater significance than others. Uh, and in the case of skeletal muscle fibers, it serves a huge significance. Uh, skeletal muscle fibers have resting membrane potentials just like neurons do. The only difference is skeletal muscle fibers are actually a little bit more negative. Their resting membrane potential is around negative 90 millivolts. We don't have anywhere near the amount of time in this course to discuss why that's the case. Like why is a skeletal muscle fiber have a resting membrane potential of negative 90 and a neuron has a resting membrane potential of negative 70? Uh, there are some intricacies there that we don't have time for. I would gladly discuss this with any one of you. If you're curious, uh, it's quite easy to explain, but it probably takes 30 minutes. Um, the really basic explanation that doesn't do justice, right? It doesn't do, it doesn't explain it in its entirety, is that skeletal muscle fibers are a little bit more permeable to potassium and a little bit less permeable to sodium than neurons are. And ultimately that translates into you needing a more negative interior in order to pull potassium backwards at the same rate that you can pull sodium inward so that just as much potassium leaves as sodium comes in. 
And at that point, you, you, you reach a resting membrane potential, right? Where just as many positively charged ions are leaving as positively charged ions are coming in. That would account for why uh, the skeletal muscle fiber has a more negative resting membrane potential than a neuron. Although there are some more intricacies to it, mostly related to the ion chloride. I'd happily discuss it with you if you're interested, but you don't need to understand it uh, in order to make sense of what's coming here. So what happens is when the alpha motor neuron releases acetylcholine, right, through exocytosis, acetylcholine will bind to ligand-gated channels on the skeletal muscle fiber. And these ligand-gated channels are of course specific to acetylcholine and what they really are are sodium channels okay these nicotinic cholinergic receptors as they're called um, they're really just sodium channels and i've already told you skeletal muscle fibers have a very very low permeability to sodium probably even less than neurons do okay and the interior is negative 90. so the point is if acetylcholine can bind to ligand-gated channels on the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber and cause these ligand-gated channels, which are really sodium channels, to open up, like that's what happens, right? Acetylcholine is the ligand, and it binds to these ligand-gated channels, which are really sodium channels, and that's what causes them to pop open. What have you done to the skeletal muscle fiber? acetylcholine significantly increases the muscle fibers uh, permeability to sodium because acetylcholine binds to and opens acetylcholine uh, you know channels located on the skeletal muscle fiber and then you have to think okay if acetylcholine is released by alpha motor neurons and then the acetylcholine binds to ligand-gated channels that are specific to acetylcholine on the skeletal muscle fiber, which are really sodium channels, and causes those channels to all open up, which increases the sodium permeability to the skeletal muscle fiber. What's going to happen? You've seen this a million times, even if it wasn't specific to muscle fibers. Sodium from the interstitial fluid is just going to shoot in like crazy. Right. Sodium has a very strong both chemical driving force, it's high outside, low inside, and also incredibly potent electrical driving force. The inside of a skeletal muscle fiber is negative 90. Right? That's, that, has a, that means that the drive for sodium to come in is really significant. And if acetylcholine opens up what are essentially sodium channels, ligand-gated channels specific to acetylcholine on the skeletal muscle fiber, then sodium is just going to rocket into the skeletal muscle fiber. And now what is the skeletal muscle fiber gaining? Well, it's gaining a whole bunch of sodium ions. So what's going to happen to the interior of the muscle fiber? The interior of the muscle fiber is going to depolarize, right? It's going to become more positive because it's gaining positively charged sodium ions. Acetylcholine released by alpha motor neurons depolarizes skeletal muscle fibers. Next up, here is the alpha motor neuron. Okay. Here is the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber. Okay, what has happened? The alpha motor neuron generated an action potential and that action potential caused exocytosis of its neurotransmitter, which is ACH or acetylcholine. Okay. Acetylcholine was released into the synaptic cleft, right, the space between the axon terminal button of the alpha motor neuron and the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber, and then acetylcholine bound to ligand-gated channels called nicotinic cholinergic receptors located on the skeletal muscle fiber, which are really just sodium channels. And of course, since acetylcholine is the ligand, it bound to these channels and it caused them to open up, right? It removed the gate. And that then significantly increased the skeletal muscle fibers permeability to sodium, 
and sodium shot in through its chemical and electrical driving force and depolarizes the skeletal muscle fiber. All right, now this is gonna be just like a neuron. Okay. You can depolarize uh, a neuron within a specific dendritic region, right? But that doesn't mean that you've influenced the more distal portions um, of the dendrite or the cell body or the hillock or whatever at all, right? All you've done is depolarize that one location within that one dendrite. And that's exactly what's happened here with the skeletal muscle fiber. All we've done is depolarize the skeletal muscle fiber right underneath where the um, axon terminal button is located. We haven't depolarized the skeletal muscle fiber over here. It's still negative 90, negative 90, negative 90, negative 90, negative 90. Okay. All we've done is depolarize the skeletal muscle fiber underneath the axon terminal button of the alpha motor neuron. Okay, so how much have we depolarized it? We just need to start making stuff up. Let's say that we went from negative 90 up to negative 20. Okay. We depolarized by 70 millivolts. So if we drive this region from negative 90 to negative 20, right, up by 70 millivolts, we've depolarized this region underneath the axon terminal button by 70 millivolts, but we haven't changed the membrane potential at all of the skeletal muscle fiber more distally. So what's going to happen, right? We have all these sodium ions in here underneath the axon terminal button that have driven the interior up and depolarized it. Uh, but that hasn't changed anything uh, about the more distal regions of the, of the skeletal muscle fiber. Well, you can imagine this is going to be just like a neuron, right? The sodium ions, this wave of positivity is going to start moving towards areas where it's subsequently more negative, right? This wave of positivity, this, these sodium ions are going to get pulled into the area of the muscle fiber where it's still negative 90 and it's going to depolarize that region. And then you have to realize what exists in this area of the skeletal muscle fiber. Well, down the entire length of the skeletal muscle fiber, right? I should say this more accurately, down the entire length of the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber are voltage-gated sodium channels. Just like you would find in the hillock region of a neuron, and then of course down the length of its axon. There's really no equivalent inside of a skeletal muscle fiber of like a hillock in a neuron. Right next to this region of the plasma membrane underneath the axon terminal button of the alpha motor neuron, there are voltage gated sodium channels. Okay, the, let's say that I, if you use the term correctly, it would sound like this. The plasma membrane that sits right underneath the axon terminal button of an alpha motor neuron, it's actually called the motor end plate of a skeletal muscle fiber. The motor end plate is the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber that sits underneath the axon terminal button of an alpha motor neuron. So the appropriate way to say this would be voltage-gated sodium channels lie adjacent to the motor end plate, right? You, with the, another way of saying that, the simpler way of saying that, of course, would be the voltage-gated sodium channels exist in the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber right next to uh, where the plasma membrane sits underneath the axon terminal button of an alpha motor neuron. So the point is, if you can get these sodium ions, right, this wave of positivity into this adjacent region of the skeletal muscle fiber, and it's going to head there naturally, and you make that region more positive, what do you think is going to happen? Well, voltage-gated sodium channels in the plasma membrane of this region are going to start opening within the skeletal muscle fiber. That's exactly what's going to happen. And when they open up, of course, that's going to cause sodium, again, to shoot into this region 
and make it really positive on the inside. Probably drive the interior up to like positive 10 or even positive 20 millivolts. Uh, that's what's going to happen. And then what do you think is going to happen? If sodium rushes in and drives this region up to positive 10 and the adjacent region of the skeletal muscle fiber is still negative 90, well, then the sodium ions, this wave of positivity, is going to head into the next region. And it's going to make that region more positive. And it's going to open up voltage-gated sodium channels in that region. And then what's going to happen? You're going to increase the sodium permeability in that region. Sodium is going to rush in. And it's going to drive the interior of that region up to positive 10 or positive 20. And then what's going to happen? The wave of positivity, the sodium ions, are going to move into the next adjacently negative region of the skeletal muscle fiber, make that region more positive. The voltage-gated sodium channels are going to open in the plasma membrane of that region. Sodium is going to shoot in. It's going to drive that region up to positive 10. What's happening here? The answer is an action potential is traveling down a skeletal muscle fiber. Right? It's traveling down the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber. What has the alpha motor neuron actually done? The alpha motor neuron has actually just passed an action potential to this skeletal muscle fiber. Skeletal muscle fibers can generate action potentials just like neurons can. The difference is, again, that you know inside of a skeletal muscle fiber, there's not like a hillock region. Okay, the, the, the waves of positivity, the electrical impulses uh, in a neuron, they have to travel from the dendritic regions into the hillock region and get the hillock region to threshold. Within a skeletal muscle fiber, there's no hillock region. The skeletal muscle fibers are very, very easy to get to threshold because the depolarization, that, that wave of positivity that happens, you know, underneath the motor end plate, underneath the axon terminal button, right? This wave of positivity, this depolarization, we said from negative 90 up to negative 20, uh, that wave of positivity only needs to move over a very short distance. And if you get enough sodium ions into that region, which actually happens every single time that an action potential is passed to a skeletal muscle fiber, um, if you get enough sodium ions into that region to make it positive enough, then the voltage-gated sodium channels will pop open, sodium will shoot in, and you'll start seeing an action potential propagate down the skeletal muscle fiber. The kind of adjacent plasma membrane uh, to the motor end plate, right, kind of serves as the hillock region of the skeletal muscle fiber, although in reality there's really nothing equivalent in the skeletal muscle fiber. I guess I'm saying that to try to make things a little bit easier for you to understand, right? If you, if you get enough sodium from underneath the axon terminal button you know, kind of region of the skeletal muscle fiber into this adjacent region of the skeletal muscle fiber and to open up the voltage-gated sodium channels in the plasma membrane, then you're going to get an action potential that ultimately propagates down the skeletal muscle fiber. And now we reach the most important question, which is what's the point of an alpha motor neuron passing an action potential to a skeletal muscle fiber in the first place. Right, so here's the alpha motor neuron. The alpha motor neuron had an action potential passed to it by a neuron uh, from the primary motor cortex. And then the alpha motor neuron generated an action potential and that action potential then caused the alpha motor neuron to release acetylcholine through exocytosis, right? And acetylcholine, also known as ACH, right, opened up ligand-gated channels on the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber, right, uh, which are really sodium channels. Acetylcholine binds to and opens up ligand-gated channels called nicotinic cholinergic receptors, actually, on the plasma membrane um, of the skeletal muscle fiber. These ligand-gated channels that bind acetylcholine called nicotinic cholinergic receptors are really just sodium channels. Okay? So what acetylcholine does is it increases the skeletal muscle fibers sodium permeability. And sodium then shoots in 
right, through these ligand gated channels, which are sodium channels, and that depolarizes the skeletal muscle fiber, right? It makes the skeletal muscle fiber more positive. Specifically, it only depolarizes the skeletal muscle fiber um, underneath its motor end plate. One more time, the motor end plate is the portion of the plasma membrane that exists underneath the axon terminal button of the alpha motor neuron. So now the plasma membrane, like the, the, the skeletal muscle fiber, the portion of the skeletal muscle fiber that lies underneath the axon terminal button of the alpha motor neuron has been depolarized, right? The region underneath the motor end plate of the muscle fiber has been depolarized. What's gonna happen next? Okay. That depolarization, that wave of positivity is going to get pulled into the adjacently negative region of the skeletal muscle fiber. By that I mean this wave of positivity, these sodium ions, right, are going to get pulled into the region of the muscle fiber that lies right next to the motor end plate, the plasma membrane underneath the axon terminal button. And in that region, there are voltage-gated sodium channels in the plasma membrane. Uh, and if enough sodium can get into this region to drive it up to threshold, and it very easily can, because this region lies right next to, adjacent to where the motor end plate is, so it's very easy to get enough sodium into this region to, to drive it to what's called threshold. Okay, Basically meaning you get the interior positive enough for these voltage-gated sodium channels to open. It's just like in the hillock of, of a neuron. Okay, So enough sodium positivity moves from underneath uh, the motor end plate, underneath the axon terminal button, into this adjacently negative region to drive it up, uh, to, you know, to depolarize it enough so that the voltage-gated sodium channels open. And now an action potential has begun. Right? These voltage-gated sodium channels open, sodium shoots in, drives the interior up to like positive 10, then it moves into the next negative region, and more voltage-gated sodium channels open up because the interior becomes more positive. Sodium shoots in uh, and makes that region more positive, moves into the next region uh, that is, is still negative, makes that region positive, and now voltage-gated sodium channels open up. What we're seeing is the action potential propagate down the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber, just like the action potential propagates down the axon of a neuron. But here is where things get a little different. Right? What is an extension of the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber? And the answer is the T-tubule. Okay? The T-tubule is, ex is an extension of the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber that actually extends into the skeletal muscle fiber. Okay? So the point is, if voltage-gated sodium channels exist down the length of the skeletal muscle fiber's plasma membrane, then do you think that they're also located in the T-tubule? Well, they have to be, because the T-tubule is just an extension of the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber. And if the plasma membrane, I mean, sorry, if the action potential is propagating down the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber, then it also must propagate down the T-tubule because the T-tubule is just an extension of the plasma membrane that moves into the skeletal muscle fiber. And that's what we need to look at now. This image from your textbook is trying to show that the T-tubule is just an extension of the plasma membrane. So what exists down the plasma membrane? Voltage-gated sodium channels, right? That's how the action potential propagates down a skeletal muscle fiber because there are voltage-gated sodium channels down the length of the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber. That's how an action potential propagates, you know, down a neuron. The, the axon, you know, is the, the, the axon is surrounded by a plasma membrane and there are voltage-gated sodium channels that exist down the axon and really thus the plasma membrane of a neuron, okay? So the point I'm trying to make here if the action potential is propagating down the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber, 
And the T-tubule is an extension just of the plasma membrane, then there must be voltage-gated sodium channels that exist down the T-tubule because the T-tubule is the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber. It just extends into the skeletal muscle fiber. Okay, so now you can see, right, the plasma membrane is... Right, allowing for the action potential to propagate. Sodium is shooting in, driving this region, you know, up to positive 10. It's still negative 90 over here. So the wave of positivity heads into this region, makes it more positive. Then voltage gated sodium channels open up. Sodium shoots in, makes this region positive 10. Okay. Well, in these regions down here, Underneath the T-tubule, which is, again, just an extension of the plasma membrane, it's still negative 90. So what's going to happen? Sodium, this wave of positivity, is going to move from this region of the plasma membrane into this region of the plasma membrane where it's still negative 90. And by that, I mean sodium is going to move into the region of the muscle fiber that is right underneath the T-tubule. And it's gonna make that region more positive, right? And as it becomes more positive, what's gonna happen? Voltage-gated sodium channels in the T-tubule, which is an extension of the plasma membrane, uh, are gonna open up and sodium is gonna shoot in and drive this region to positive 10. And now what's gonna happen? Sodium is going to move from this region underneath the T-tubule to the next region underneath the T-tubule where it's still negative 90. And it's going to make that region more positive. And voltage-gated sodium channels within the plasma membrane of the T-tubule are going to open in this region. And sodium is going to shoot in. And it's going to make this region positive 10. So what are you actually seeing here? You're seeing the action potential propagate down the T-tubule. Right? And that should make sense because if the action potential can propagate down the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber, then it must be able to propagate down the T-tubule of the muscle fiber too. Let's draw it a little bit differently because uh, maybe this diagram from the text is throwing you off. So here is the plasma membrane. There's the T-tubule, right? Because the T-tubule is just an extension of the plasma membrane. If the action potential is propagating down the plasma membrane. Okay, so here's a wave of positivity, right? Sodium ions, it's positive 10 right here. In this region, it's still negative 90. The wave of positivity, uh, sodium ions head into this adjacently negative region and make it more positive. And now the voltage gated sodium channels in the plasma membrane of this region open up. Sodium rushes in, makes this region positive 10. All right, the T-tubule, as I've said 200 times, is an extension of the plasma membrane. So thus, there must be voltage-gated sodium channels that travel down uh, the T-tubule as well. And there are, okay? And underneath these regions of the T-tubule, it's still negative 90, right? Negative 90, negative 90. So these sodium ions within this region underneath the plasma membrane, right, that are making it positive 10, right? This wave of positivity, is going to head into this region underneath the T-tubule where it's still negative 90 and make that region more positive. And by making that region more positive, now voltage-gated sodium channels within the plasma membrane of the T-tubule are going to open up and sodium is going to shoot in. And underneath the T-tubule, right, it's going to rise to positive 10. And now this wave of positivity, this, these sodium ions underneath this section of the T-tubule are going to move into the more adjacently I mean, in, into the adjacent region underneath the T-tubule where it's still negative 90. And it's going to make that region more positive. And now more voltage-gated sodium channels in the, in the, in the T-tubule, the plasma membrane, are going to open up. Sodium is going to shoot into that region. It's going to become positive 10. You're seeing the, you're seeing the, the action potential propagate down the T-tubule. The action potential moves down the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber, also called its sarcolemma, and thus into and down its T-tubule, because the T-tubule is an extension of the plasma membrane. That's the first part you have to see.
and the first part you have to recognize. The purpose of an alpha motor neuron passing an action potential to a skeletal muscle fiber is so the skeletal muscle fiber will generate an action potential. And the purpose of an action potential propagating down a skeletal muscle fiber is ultimately so the action potential will move into its T tubule and down its T tubule. And now the question, of course, becomes what's the point of an action potential propagating down the plasma membrane and thus down the T tubule? To answer that question, you have to remember what lies next to the T tubule. What lies next to the T tubule is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the SR, right? That webbing like structure. And what's within the SR? Calcium. Okay. So you can see that the SR, we went through this already, but the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, lies next to the T tubule on both sides. And ultimately, this is very important for understanding the purpose of why we need the action potential to travel down the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber and thus down the T tubule. Here is the T tubule again. And I'm drawing voltage gated sodium channels in the membrane of the T tubule again, which is just the plasma membrane. Okay. At certain locations of the T tubule, you end up finding what are called voltage gated calcium channels. I'll draw them right there. Um, and specifically, these voltage gated calcium channels are what are called DHP receptors. That stands for dihydropyridine. But they're just a type of voltage gated calcium channel. And, you know, what's the relevance of this? Okay. The point is, if the action potential is propagating down the T-tubule, right, and voltage-gated sodium channels within the T-tubule are opening up, and sodium is shooting in, making this region positive 10, and, you know, the subsequent region of the underneath the T-tubule is still negative 90, and if sodium moves into this region and makes this region more positive, then what's going to open up? Right. As the action potential propagates into this region of the muscle fiber underneath the T tubule and makes this region more positive, what will open up are these voltage-gated calcium channels. Right. Instead of voltage-gated sodium channels opening up, what we find in the T tubule, you know, at different points of the T tubule, this isn't this isn't in every single part of the T tubule, but in different portions of the T tubule, we find these dihydropyridine receptors, these voltage-gated calcium channels. And as these regions become more positive, right, because of the sodium ions moving into them, that causes the voltage-gated calcium channels to open up, just like you would expect. And here's the thing. These don't actually really allow calcium in. What, what actually happens is within the sarcoplasmic reticulum, there are uh what are called ryanidine receptors the, the they're called ryr receptors okay they're right here and the ryanidine receptors are actually physically attached to the dhp receptors the voltage gated calcium channels in the t tubule okay? and, and this is the point of these voltage gated calcium channels opening up when these voltage-gated calcium channels open up in the T-tubule, thanks to the action potential propagating down the T-tubule, when they open, they don't really allow much, if any, calcium into the muscle fiber. What they do is they pull on these ryanidine receptors found on the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And when they pull on them, it actually causes them to pop open. So the opening of the DHP receptors, these voltage-gated calcium channels in the T tubule, actually pulls on and opens the ryanidine receptors in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Because right? they're they're kind of I've heard this you know discussed as if the the di the DHP receptors are attached to the ryanidine receptors you know almost uh, like a piston, 
And when the, Diana, the, the DHP receptors, the voltage-gated calcium channels open, the DHP receptors like a piston pull on the ryanidine receptors and actually cause the ryanidine receptors to pop open. And then through diffusion, right, these ryanidine receptors, first of all, they're, they're, cal they're, they're actually calcium channels. Okay? Uh, they're like calcium pores, essentially, that are closed. And if the DHP receptor within the T tubule pops open and it opens the ryanidine receptors, that gives calcium a way to actually leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum and enter into the cytosol, the intracellular fluid, of the skeletal muscle fiber. So let's focus in on this. Uh, here is, again, the T-tubule. Within the T-tubule, we find DHP receptors, which are really just voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay. Next to the T-tubule, there is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Within the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane, we find ryanidine receptors, RYR. Okay. The DHP, the dihydropyridine receptors within the T-tubule, are physically attached to the ryanidine receptors, the RYR receptors, within the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the RYR receptors really are like a, they're like, they're a calcium channel as well, but they're, they're, they're not voltage gated. They're, they're, it's, it's, I don't know exactly how you would want to term them. They're like a pore uh, that's, that's gated, that's closed. Okay. Now, as the action potential propagates down the plasma membrane uh, of the skeletal muscle fiber, it's then going to propagate, of course, down the T tubule because, well, the T tubule is an extension of the plasma membrane. How is that also possible? Because voltage gated sodium channels exist down the length of the plasma membrane and down the length of uh, the T tubule. So the action potential propagates down the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber, propagates down the T tubule, and as the action potential propagates down the T tubule, that action potential causes DHP receptors, right? Dihydropyridine receptors, voltage gated calcium channels, more important than anything, to open. This is much like how the voltage gated calcium channels within the axon terminal button of a neuron open. Okay. The action potential travels into the axon terminal button, that wave of positivity, and makes the axon terminal button more positive, and then that opens the voltage-gated calcium channels within the button. It's the same kind of thing here. The action potential is traveling down the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber and then down the T tubule, and that action, action potential, that wave of positivity, heading into this region of the skeletal muscle fiber underneath the T-tubule where the DHP receptor is in the membrane, right? That action potential, that wave of positivity, opens up these DHP receptors, these voltage-gated calcium channels. And when they open, they don't really allow calcium in. What they do instead is they tug on the ryanidine receptors, the RYR receptors on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And when the DHP receptors tug on these ryanidine receptors, they cause them to pop open. And when they pop open, what that does is it allows calcium to shoot out, right? Because these RYR receptors are really, a, they're a type of calcium channel. How exactly you want to define them is kind of difficult to do, uh, but but they're, they're a closed calcium channel. And the DHP receptor, the voltage-gated calcium channel, when it opens, it tugs on the ryanidine receptors and it opens them. And that actually then allows calcium to spill out into the intracellular fluid of the skeletal muscle fiber. And then you think, well, what's the relevance of all this? First of all, this is how your text uh, depicts this. The purple things there are the DHP receptors, okay, the dihydropyridine receptors. And you can see that the DHP receptors are attached to, kind of in green-ish, uh, the ryanidine receptors on the membrane of the SR. Right? So it's trying to show you the association 
between the DHP receptors within the T-tubule and the ryanidine receptors uh, within the membrane of the SR. Like there's the relationship right here. And it's also trying to show you that when the DHP receptors open, these voltage-gated calcium channels, really their job is to tug on the ryanidine receptors and open them. And then that allows calcium to spill out of the SR. I'm very much a visual person. Uh, so I like to provide more rather than less images. This is another image of the same thing from another textbook that I like. Okay, So here you can see the DHP receptor uh, within the uh, T-tubule, right? And you can see how the DHP receptor is attached to the ryanidine receptor within the membrane of the SR. And when the DHP receptor, the voltage-gated calcium channel opens, thanks to an action potential propagating down the T-tubule, uh, it can tug on the ryanidine receptor uh, and it kind of pulls it and thus opens the ryanidine receptor, which is really a passageway, a pore, a channel for calcium. And if this calcium channel within the membrane of the SR opens, then calcium can spill out of the SR. And what's the purpose of calcium? Well, clearly, if you can allow calcium to spill out of the SR, what's calcium going to do? Calcium is going to go and bind to troponin, right, which exists on the actin filaments uh, that are part of, of course, the sarcomeres within the myofibrils. And if calcium binds to troponin, what happens? If, if you remember, calcium binding to troponin causes a conformational shift in, in troponin, and it pushes the strand-like protein, tropomyosin, off of the myosin binding sites on all of the different G-actins. And that then, of course, would allow for the myosin heads to be able to interact with actin. And we've already established this, right? That's how force is generated within a muscle fiber. It's through the interaction of the myosin heads with actin. The only way that the myosin heads and actin are going to interact is if, tropo, if, if troponin can push tropomyosin off of the myosin binding sites on all the different G-actins. And that's what calcium elevating inside of the muscle fiber allows for, right? Calcium elevating inside of the muscle fiber results in and allows for myosin and actin to actually be able to interact with each other because calcium will bind to troponin, which will cause a conformational shift in the troponin protein and push tropomyosin off of the myosin binding sites. And that will then finally allow for myosin and actin to interact. And now the muscle fiber will be able to contract, right? That's what a contraction is. What myosin and actin interacting is a muscle fiber contraction. And that's how force is generated. And that's finally what puts all of this together. The purpose of an alpha motor neuron passing an action potential to a skeletal muscle fiber is so that the skeletal muscle fiber will generate an action potential and that action potential will cause the skeletal muscle fiber to release calcium from its sarcoplasmic reticulum. And if calcium is released, then calcium will allow for myosin and actin to interact with each other because calcium will bind to troponin. So collectively, you, you can't get a muscle fiber to contract unless you pass an action potential to it, right? You need alpha motor neurons to pass action potentials to muscle fibers in order for those muscle fibers to ultimately contract. Because what do action potentials do? When skeletal muscle fibers generate action potentials, the purpose of those action potentials is to cause the release of calcium within the fiber, and that allows 
for a contraction, for myosin and actin to interact. That's what a contraction is. Now, obviously, you need a relaxation to occur after a contraction as well, right? So what is located also in the membrane of the SR are these things called circa pumps, okay? Sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase is what that stands for. Uh, basically, what that means, it's a calcium pump. Okay, uh, it's a pump for calcium that is a type of uh, primary active transport. Basically, these are protein pumps, and what they do is they take calcium from the intracellular fluid from the cytosol and they kick calcium back into the SR. Okay, you have to actually move calcium from a lower concentration in the intracellular fluid and the cytosol to a higher concentration in the SR. And you might think that's confusing, but in reality, not that much calcium has actually been released, as you're going to see in future lectures, from the SR yet. Like a very little amount of calcium in reality has actually been released. Like there's still, and there are always scientists debate this, but there's going to typically be, no matter what the case is, way more calcium in the SR than there is within the cytosol, the intracellular fluid. So the point is, the calcium concentrations within the intracellular fluid are always less, almost always, let's say, less than the calcium concentrations within the SR. So if you want to move calcium from the cytosol, the intracellular fluid, back into the SR, you need to move it against its concentration gradient and thus you need these circa pumps, right? They use ATP to be able to move calcium from a low concentration in the cytosol to a high concentration in the SR. And uh, thus it's primary active transport. And what the circa pumps do is they allow for relaxation, right? Because if you take all the calcium in the cytosol, the intracellular fluid, and you pump it back into the, into the SR and you remove the calcium from the inside, then there's no calcium to bind to troponin and tro troponin will go back to its original orientation and tropomyosin will cover up the myosin binding sites on all the different G actins again and myosin and actin will no longer be able to interact. So this is how relaxation happens after a contraction. The calcium gets pumped back into uh, the SR. And when you take the calcium and you pump it back into the SR, um, there's no more calcium in the intracellular fluid, the cytosol, uh, to bind to troponin. So if calcium is not bound to troponin, tropomyosin returns to covering up actin, and myosin and actin can't interact, and you have now a relaxed muscle fiber. What that means with a relaxed muscle fiber is it's not contracting. Myosin and actin are no longer interacting. The biggest thing that I always hope that you can take out of any lecture is the big picture, right? I want you to be able to look at an image like this and you actually know what it's showing you, right? This image is showing us how muscle fibers within our muscles are ultimately able to contract, right? We have a, let's go through the original example. You decide that you wanna lift a glass up to take a drink of water. What do you need to do in order to do that? You need to contract muscle fibers within your biceps muscle to produce force so that elbow flexion can be produced and thus you can pick up the glass and take a drink. Okay, so you have a conscious thought that you wanna lift that glass up and thus through that conscious thought, right, it's determined that you need to contract biceps muscle fibers in order to, to to flex the elbow, pick up the glass, and take a drink. So through that conscious thought, neurons up in specific portions of the primary motor cortex start generating action potentials. And what do they do? They pass those action potentials using the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate to alpha motor neurons in the spinal cord. And these are specifically alpha motor neurons that travel out through cervical nerves to the biceps muscle fibers, okay? So these alpha motor neurons, now thanks to these primary motor cortex neurons, start generating action potentials. 
And what's the purpose of these alpha motor neurons here? Generating action potentials. Well, it's to pass those action potentials to the muscle fibers within the biceps muscle that they synapse with. Right? They're going to release acetylcholine, ACH, onto those muscle fibers. And that acetylcholine is going to bind to ligand gated channels on those skeletal muscle fibers um, and open them. And that's going to allow sodium into those skeletal muscle fibers. And thus, the, the skeletal muscle fibers are going to generate an action potential. And when the skeletal muscle fibers generate an action potential, what does the action potential do to the muscle fibers? Right? The action potential propagates down the plasma membrane into the T-tubule, opens up DHP receptors, which pull on the ryanidine receptors, and that allows calcium out of the SRs, of these fibers that synapse with the alpha motor neuron, ultimately. So the action potential from the alpha motor neuron to these skeletal muscle fibers ultimately results in these skeletal muscle fibers releasing calcium from their SRs into their intracellular fluid. And then that calcium that elevates allows these muscle fibers to contract, right? It allows for the myosin and actin within them to interact and force is generated. And then when muscle fibers within your biceps muscle generate force, what happens next? That force gets relayed from the muscle fibers to the endomysium, uh, which is you know, continuous with the tendon, so onto the tendon, onto the bone, and by relaying the force onto the bone, you pull the radius towards the scapula and the elbow flexes, and you're able to pick up the glass and take a drink. That, of course, is the goal here because it's all a puzzle that fits together quite wonderfully uh, if you put time into trying to understand it. This same pathway is how we contract all of the skeletal muscles within our body, right? We say that our primary motor cortex, which is of course a portion of the cerebral cortex, is what controls all of the skeletal muscles within our body. And it's true because the primary motor cortex is what has the ability to activate the different alpha motor neurons throughout the spinal cord, which are what activate the muscle fibers within different muscles. So this lecture showed you the basics by which an alpha motor neuron allows a skeletal muscle fiber to contract by passing an action potential to it. And in the next lecture, we're gonna start getting into some more intricacies, uh, specifically about the you know, characteristics of you know, contractions within fibers. What causes them to generate more or less force? What causes them to generate more or less force? Um, you know, we'll differentiate a little bit between different muscle fiber types. We'll also talk about the the whole muscle and how the whole muscle can generate different amounts of force versus individual fibers. We're just going to get into some more granular granular detail about muscle contractions.